Welcome to the Supported Living Property Podcast with your host, me, Lisa Brown, the place to learn about supported living property investing. Hi, Caroline. It's great to have you here today. Um, For those people who don't know you, do you want to introduce yourself and tell people a bit about who you are? Uh, fabulous. Hi, Lisa. Hi, everyone else. My name is Caroline, Caroline Marsh, and I'm the co-founder of Kingdom News Services based in Swindon, and we are service providers for 16 plus uh, in the UK, um, supporting individuals who have challenges, you know, mental health challenges, for, you know, from autism to um, even just behavioural challenges. So, yes. A whole range of different support uh-huh. needs there in that, age, in that age group. Now, obviously, you've not done this for your whole of your lifetime, have you? You've had a really yeah. interesting sort of trajectory to get to this point. Do you want to explain where you started from and how you've ended up doing what you're doing? Absolutely. So my journey has not always been in health and social care. In fact, I'll call myself a newbie uh, in the industry. Uh, prior to us being providers, we, we've only just been going, believe it or not, since 2020. So before that, my journey has been around property investments. So I was a property investor and I still am a property investor. And uh, we did um, providing accommodation for working professionals and we did HMOs in Swindon and that was quite successful. And uh, 2000, uh, in fact, the journey began uh, prior to that in 2006 where I started to look at what else could I do? Um, Just, you know, I loved property, not the buildings, but, you know, the parts around people. So it started off from that desire that led me to finding a property investor, Steve Bolton, who worked with me as a mentor and helped me how to establish a really good business, which has been, you know, amazing. Now, moving forward to 2020, we all were in lockdown and uh, both my husband and I began to talk about what we could do in our local community but to be able to impact others. And one of the things that really struck a chord with us was uh, seeing how many young people in the community that were affected negatively due to the COVID-19, the lockdown itself. So we thought, what can we do? And uh, before that, someone that we knew, a very close um, person to us, found themselves in a bit of trouble. And they were obviously a young person at the time. Um, they were uh, very unfortunate, went out drinking and from getting drunk, got into a fight from that fight, punched somebody. And unfortunately, that person that ended up going to prison uh, shouldn't have ended up going into prison. And, you know, of course, I do not excuse people ha- you know, being violent. However, it was the circumstances. Um, and so long story out of that, that individual, we supported and helped them along the way came out of prison and they integrated back into society quite successfully. So as a result of that, we thought, well, can we do something helping young people and um, see where that goes? And we called our local authority at the time in lockdown and they told us, you know, the great need and we thought we want to do something. So from that conversation led on to meeting commissioners and discussing, yes, we could do this. And we did have I think we had one or two houses that were unoccupied. Um, Initially, in fact, we were thinking of providing um, a shelter to the homeless. So there was was so much going on, whereas Mm. people found themselves in very difficult circumstances. So we thought maybe have them for homeless people or housing them or finding other people until they said, well, actually, there is a people group and this need is getting greater. And because we were able to resonate, we thought, let's just start something. And so, we, you know, from that consultation led on to finding uh, some really key people who helped us along the journey. Um, my husband's an accountant, so he obviously has no understanding either about health and social care. But what <laughs> really matters for us is our heart. So we didn't stumble upon, you know, it wasn't a financial gain. It was impact on what we could do to help others. And then from that, my gosh, you know, it's like I should have done this like 20 years ago. We should have started this whole journey because it's so fulfilling. It's hard. Don't you know? misunderstand me. It really is a hard business. However, when you look at the impact that you're having in communities, the changes and just positive, you know, someone was almost a write off. Society said you would never amount to anything. You're finished, turn 18, let them just go through the whole system. And many of them, drugs, alcohol, and then the next thing is prison. Mm. Uh, and that someone's future is that, you know, just there, just one encounter could change and everything else changes for the better. So, yeah, that's where we are. That's what we're doing right now. 
it's amazing. I love your energy about it all and, and how excited you are um, by it. We've, you know, I speak to a lot of people in looking at supported living. I speak to a lot of property investors who have seen the numbers. So they they see how much rent they get. And then they're talking to the providers and they work out actually the providers get an awful lot more money each week from the local authority. And they're thinking, I'd like a little bit of that. I think I'm going to set up as a provider. I probably have this conversation at least once a week. Oh my God. What would you say to those people? Well, you better be in the right headspace, first of all, okay? Because it's one, not for the faint-hearted, and two, the profit margins, um, they might look attractive, but my goodness me, the overheads as well are huge. Unless you're doing it in a way that you're out there to just... Um, barely spend any money and just trying to keep everything else or which from our point of view then it's not there's no real success you're not literally impacting lives there's a lot of investment that has to go into one individual yes the rentals might be a little bit higher than your normal ones but there again for example we have an individual when they come in this is just a normal it's not a normal tenant that just comes in they've got their bags and that's them ready now week one get ready for maybe even your house being trashed I mean, we've had where they've turned up and that's going to cost you more money. So if you're starting off from that point of view, you have to think about the cost implications and it's huge. So setting up is not easy. The job itself is so involving. So and emotionally, you get attached to this. You know, these are human beings Mm. that have life going on. And switching off is not a natural progression. Like I'm going to bed and then I wake up tomorrow morning. No, you have police involved. You have uh, all other stakeholders involved. It's not an easy journey. I'll say do it for the right reason. If you want to do it, don't do it for the for the money because the money again is not. If that's your big drive, wrong business. Mm. Uh, I will say to you, do it because you are called to be in this industry and you want to really like, literally make greater impact. Um, and again, if you're getting into it for you don't make the monies, you know, like from the onset, look at it long haul. You know, you invest everything else because you're going to enjoy the legacy you're going to leave behind. And then also the profits will come in much later, not the first few years of establishment. It's not worked that way for us. We've had to invest heavily, heavily. When I mean heavily, it is expensive. Everything is setting up the, you know, upfront costs, my gosh, insurance, uh, um, uh, everything stuff you you literally are paying forward and saying well we'll invest x amount of money to get started and uh with the hope that you'll get that money back so that yeah. will be my yeah yeah and i think also you know i adding into that is that i think they then say oh but i'll just get a reg- unemployed registered manager and then i can do it in a hands-off way <laughs> you're shaking your head there what what are you thinking <laughs> no, it's not as easy as that. You literally, you're if being a director, you are involved in the running of the business. And it's not something that's why I'm, you know, like my emphasis is let your heart be in it. This is not something you're handing over to somebody else. We have um six managers currently, but I'm still quite heavily involved. When we started off, I wasn't, I was we didn't have that many managers, but when we started, I was very, very heavily involved in it. I had to get myself uh, in a place where I understand the needs and understand and be there to support the, the whole team. Yes, you have your RM or your registered manager doing all the, you know, uh, they're responsible for the service. However, that is your business. And uh, you just can't switch off and say, well, see you tomorrow. And I think I don't I don't believe that that's very that's um as a director, it's good practice. You you know, if you do something, be part of it. Let the team know that you're in this together. It's not them and I get the profits while I go to sleep and the rest of you carry on and do some work. I, that That's not how I would say it. Uh, I don't know how long you outlive your registered managers if you have that attitude. Um, yeah, so yeah. that's my opinion. No, it's true. And retaining staff is a real challenge at the moment, isn't it? It's, it's a massive, 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 yeah, massive and, challenge. And when you're looking at the, you know, when people are looking at those numbers that you get as a provider and thinking, oh, well, you you know, you're raking it in because you're getting all that money. They don't have a concept of how big your staff team is. So at the moment, you're saying you've got six registered managers. And then how many support staff would you have within there as well? So right now, unfortunately, due to the, what happened with Brexit, a lot of the key workers or, you know, health and social care workers, many of them, either have gone back to their countries. And so there's a huge shortage of staff. Um, so we are working or we have huge numbers around, you know, a few agency support workers. 
and we're recruiting every day. So we currently are just over 30 of our own staff. Um, but to make it more sustainable, we'll be needing about 50 out of current staff. That's, you know, having a, a good staffing level that allows for waking nights and uh, day shifts. With some individuals, according to you know, their support plans, they need maybe three to one or two to one in the community, depending on what their needs are. So you have to be very responsive in relation to how you have the right staffing ratios uh, within your organization. So that's it's not an easy thing to be thinking about. Uh, we're recruiting, in fact, we've now had to start recruiting um, abroad and bringing in people from, from overseas because we just haven't got enough staff. And it, that in itself must be a massive thing, just managing that number of staff. Huge. It's huge. And, and that also has cost implications because you can imagine to get sponsorship licenses, to get mm. your staff. And, and there's things like training. I mean, we, we are so heavily involved in equipping our our, 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 uh, our team. And I'm quite proud because obviously with equipping all our staff ensures that we are delivering really good support. And we just had our CQC inspection, our first ever in inspection, and we got outstanding. That's I'm amazing. so proud of our team, but we've only just done that successfully because the team are well equipped. You know, we're quite, quite responsive. We care and we do all the right things in order to make sure that we deliver. And that comes at a cost. So you have to pay in advance for all of your staff that they have the right training, they have the right support um, internally and externally. So it's not it's not an easy um, business like you just pick up a HMO and place your adverts a few you know two managers I've, I only just ever had two managers all the other staff that we had were self-employed electrician plumber it was almost a hands-off business you know it's just like okay I've got a manager and they do x y and z we source the houses do refurbishments place the advert out there referrals are coming through not in this business <laughs> <laughs> literally every hat you've got on and mm -hmm. you're out there to ensure that you set off uh, set it up in a way that is sustainable we, we are not in this for short-term gains we're in this for long term so we know that this is we're building a legacy that you know of, of a business that looks at empowering uh, others that looks at change changing communities changing aspect giving people a better quality of life you know so yeah it's amazing. And just so people can understand the number of young people that you're supporting at the moment with that staff team, where you ideally you'd be up to around 50 people. How many children, young people are you supporting? Uh, right now, about 12. So it's not a lot of children, no. but their needs are great. These mm -hmm. kids are almost like we can't can't be done with them. And a lot of them, not, not a lot, all of them need 24 hour support. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine 24 hour support. Um, you need to be quite tight with we have a lot of hours uh, in our service so we need to be quite um, strategic in delivering that level of support and having enough resources um, to support those individuals because a lot happens we our days are full uh, a lot of our, our packages are, are individuals where everybody's given up it's like last resort can't have them anymore it's like you know we're done it's, it's too much for us and we have one of like like you know very difficult packages but when they come to us we, we didn't set up for an easy piece of work we set up for transformation it's like we literally ha uh, how do we go from where you are where things have completely broken down to embracing you and the journey will look like uh, in between is it's a challenge but ultimately great success and so fulfilling so so fulfilling and tell, tell us some of the stories because when I know when we were talking before you've shared some of these stories with me about some of the things you know the impact that you're having yeah oh my gosh uh, so the one in particular that's very close to my heart is one young person that came into service and um, at the time obviously we were quite small in size and he, when he came in he said something in the lines of give me two weeks and I'll kick off and I was like okay let's see how life goes on and two weeks came and he was he said to me Caroline I do not know how I haven't kicked off and I'm still here because you know ordinarily I'll have been gone and that young person was obviously he had very challenging background um you know uh, neglect trauma name the law and we worked together with him and the journey 
was hard, but yet so fulfilling. He ended up from a young person who would go to bed three, four in the morning, five in the morning to a young person that transformed their lives to now getting themselves a job and, um, you know, getting up in the morning, seven, eight o'clock in the morning, turning up for work, all nice and well-groomed, looking after himself really well. Uh, just complete change. That child was obviously destined for prison. But actually, you know, he turned his whole life around, which is amazing. Later on, he actually became what we call expert by experience. So he then stayed on to work in our organization and working to support other young people and inspiring them and, you know, almost like giving them a chance and saying, do you know what, I can do this. And one of the things that we do within uh, Kinemi Services is we, we impact, yes, local communities, but also uh, global communities. So I introduced him to a charity that we work with in Zambia. And this kid just grew so fond of this, this community of other children in Zambia and partnered with them. And last year, um, me and him, we ended up having to go to Zambia. He raised money for them, buying school desks and things like that, changing their lives because his life's been changed. And he's no longer looking at his own self, but actually thinking about what else do I, what do I have in me that I could impact somebody else? And that was an amazing success story. Another individual came in service. um, I think they had a few months before they were going to prison and he was soon to be a dad. And we had to advocate on his behalf and say, look, just give him to us for just let, let, let's just try and, and, you know, see how we get on. And this young person w- went on from being like, you know, uh, into drugs and alcohol and everything else and going into prison, changing his life in a short space of time. And then he became a dad and uh, didn't go to prison. And now he went on to do his further education, got himself a CSES card that allows him to work on construction sites. And now he's actually got a full-time job. He's a dad, well-supported. And so those kinds of stories, when you see them, it's like, you know what, each and every one of us, there's something about the human potential. And if put in an environment where you are nurtured and allowed to be able to blossom, I think that, you know, if we do that, now not everyone is a success, but when we pour of ourselves and that ends up as a success for us, it was all worth it. So yeah, those are the two that I give an example of in terms of change. And they're amazing stories, aren't they? I think the other thing, the other conversation I have with property investors sometimes when they're thinking about how they'd like to set up a support service is, oh, but I can, I can impact people's lives. I can sit down and and I think they kind of sometimes have an image that they're going to be sat down over a cup of tea with a young person, kind of showing them how they've made a business themselves and how they can do it. Um, what would you say in response to that, Caroline? That's a dream. That's a dream. Leave that in dreamland. That doesn't <laughs> happen. OK, it does not happen. Um, there, if you can imagine this uh, individuals. They haven't had a lot of them haven't had that kind of a, a structure, you know, with their upbringing. A lot of them have gone through neglect and uh, a lot of trauma. So sitting down, the attention span is not like, you know, we can have conversation for like 20 minutes. Things are done in a very creative way. And so it's not as easy as right key work session times. You sit there, I've got my pen, you do that. It doesn't work that way. We have to find ways in, and means in which we work with them supporting them indirectly but yet arrive at the place called success with them so not true that you can plan the best plan ever but things don't always work out that way it's how you creatively work with them to ensure that they achieve their goals because ultimately this is not my goal that's their goal so how do I get them to buy into their own personal goals and desires and how do I help them with that journey I'm not it's not my achievement it's them so um don't be deceived. It, you know, you, you can have a six month plan. And in that six month plan, the one thing you've only learned to do is to get them to go to a dentist. And that's mm-hmm. success. It's like, you know, what? get me nowhere, even just to brush, like brush their teeth. Mm-hmm. That it's, it's not, it's things that we would take for granted for. It's not a natural uh, mentorship kind of support or coaching. No, this is do life with you kind of thing and you do life with someone one day at a time and depending on how they're feeling in, and if they're on drugs you know and it, and they already they have things that they're dealing with already so that is not an overnight stuff because you motivate them and inspire them it, what doesn't work that way so it's not that's why I'm a great advocate in saying that when you do this kind of a business do it out of um 
a passion and almost as a calling rather than doing it for, as a business. Of course, have, have your business element um, attached to it because obviously you need sustainability for and, and, and growth. And at the same time, you have individuals in the service, but you also have lives that are impacted. This is lives of your your you know your your workforce. So they're depending on your sustainability for them to you know also look after them and their and their lives and those uh, within their communities. So. It has a big impact, doesn't it, when you're running a service like this on an awful lot of people, as well as the people you're supporting. You know, absolutely, think, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Obviously, yeah. this is the property pod- supported living property podcast as well, and we've not really touched on the property side of things. So, you said that you own some properties already, and then you've taken those over and and put, delivering your support within them. What are the properties like? How are they different to what you might do for your private tenants? Um, so what we had to do for, with many of the, the ones that we used, we had to convert them back into your normal uh, dwellings. So this would be from a HMO to just a normal family dwelling that allowed uh them to live like in a normal family what we're trying to do is we create we've created a service that helps you to develop your skills and you know help you towards your own independence so your own independence will look like being in a normal family home so we there's not much change within the structure itself so we don't do conversions majority of the people we support don't have physical disability so we don't have to you know, we don't change our houses the configuration to allow for uh, uh, showers and things like that it's just your normal house back into a two or three bedroom house we've done very well with small houses as opposed to bigger houses so almost a waste of space having a much bigger house because a lot of them if they want you know they they there is one individual in the house then it just then means that we're turning it back into your normal dwelling and then having more stuff in that home to support um, the individuals. So not a lot of configuration, just back into your normal family home, as it were. And how many young people would you have in a property, uh, typically? It just depends. So it's very much needs dependent. So at, at times we've had, the most we've ever had was three in one home, and that was in the beginning. Whereas now where we have more complex uh, individuals, Usually it will be um, one on one in a home as opposed to having them um, multiple in one particular house. So if the needs are because, again, you, when you have you, you might have plans to have more than two children, but to be able to match those needs sometimes is quite hard. So we much rather have success with one or two than have profit margins because you've got three or four children so we're very specific around let's do a piece of work that will impact the child as opposed to having all the beds filled um so yeah yeah Mm -hmm. I think that I'm certainly with the provider I'm talking to seeing a trend towards smaller properties in this space not not the bigger ones I think you know that's right yeah you know for a range of reasons um Mm -hmm. and obviously you're talking about supporting um young people typically sort of 16 to 18 you were talking about and we're we're seeing Ofsted regulation coming into that space now aren't we so what does that mean for you um in fact originally when we started I think our goal was to set up an Ofsted provision so we we thought okay start off with uh uh, Ofsted registration and we had a bit of a challenge in hiring an Ofsted reg manager and uh, when we found one plans change we thought let's just go down CQC route and now um, with the children that we have, because they come into us when they're 16, we feel that sometimes the damage has already been done. So if we could start off when they're much younger and then avoid, you know, further damage um, when they're in service with us as they transition. So we've now had to look at registering with, with Ofsted or which we just found our reg manager. And so uh, again, we're in the process of registering with Ofsted to ensure that we are ready when regulations are changing that we already are ahead of the game and um, are running and operating as a registered provider. That's cool. Yeah, that makes sense, I guess, doesn't it? Is it? I think it's the way. That, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You may as well. Otherwise, it's just not worth it. You know, mm-hmm. And it, 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 there's a lot of work to be doing in the homes anyway. So we don't want to have to having to enough, you know, find where does the child fit? Where are we illegal? Are we not illegal? What, what does the regulation say about the children? So we want to stay above board and just register and be done with. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and for people who are interested in setting up a service, you know, they, they're listening to this and thinking, actually, this it does sound like something I want to do. I've not been put off by all the things that we've talked about. What, what, would, what advice would you give to them? What would you say to people? 
I think number one is your passion, your drive, like, you know, your passion, make sure you're doing this for the right reasons. Um, number two, I'll say getting all your processes right from the onset. So investing in, I would say, uh, getting the right support. I'm a, a great advocate of finding mentors or people that have been there and done it and standing on the shoulder of giants. However, I'm sure, you know, you allude to this yourself, like even though you want to find people that are doing it, it's um, performing extensive due diligence on where you get the support from. So you don't get caught out with getting the wrong information or they do a runner with your money because, you know, or give you the, yeah, whatever that might look like. Yeah, sadly, there are a lot of people out there who are yeah. claiming to help people get set up with services and they're not, they don't they're have the not, track record. No, no, yeah. so, that's yeah, right. Absolutely, I'd endorse yeah. that, doing that. Using, you, you need to, the support, but you need to make sure you're getting support from the right people, don't you? Exactly, exactly. And I think I found this when I was doing property investments before. It was the same thing where, you know, there were so many people that were selling seminars, property seminars. So it was, what was key was finding the right person who's been there and they've done it and you're able to see their success. Mm. you can emulate their success because it's easy for you you know you could read a book on supported living and start off <laughs> and start teaching people uh without any proof so i'd say that would be an area to look out for um recruitment is huge it's massive on you know staff retention make sure when you hire you hire people for the right reasons and then invest in your team so that looks like training them that looks like rewarding them appreciating them that looks like create a culture that is inclusive it's not them and us it's actually we together as a family we keep calling our company kys so it's like a kys family it's, it's we do life together you know whatever impacts you will impact me as well so i think recruitment on the right stuff will be great um on the culture and um uh, uh what else would i say to providers um the cost as well i mean you the cost it, implications I mean, yeah cost yeah. implications huge um, get into it for the long haul as opposed to short term. So don't think profits today uh, and it will cost a lot of money. So insurance is expensive, getting your policy, everything else setting up is expensive. In fact, you hire your reg managers and start paying them before you even have any work. So, and people don't realise that, do they? No. <laughs> no. All your support staff will be on their payroll <laughs> before mm. you've earned a penny. So you have to get them in, train them, get them ready and then start delivering the support. And when you get that as well, um, uh, you know, I don't know, it, all contracts, even when you get your first um, uh, clients or the individual in your, in your service, bear in mind that you won't get paid. Sometimes you have 30 or 60 days uh, payments uh, with your local authorities. So you better have money next to you so you can afford to pay for all your other costs uh, to ensure you can pay your staff. <laughs> Otherwise, it could be quite disa disastrous. Um, the other thing I'd say is... Um, just setting up right you know set up right from the onset and get support get um your if you if you can't afford to get somebody else as a business development manager on board then get that person so they can help you do they'll do the growing of the business whilst you focus on maybe the operations and how things are running in the organization but if you can't afford to have that on board then you know still just invest in finding somebody else who will direct you how to get on um frameworks because remember you just don't turn up frameworks do close particular certain times of, of of the year so you might start off and be a support purchaser so you might be you know buying your support from local authorities and again if you're not um if you don't understand that that's how it works you end up with all these members of staff and no work um so yeah so much to think about isn't there there's so much you need to consider and, and have yeah. in place there is a lot there is a lot that's right yeah there yeah. is a lot. I've simplified it but I tell you oh, what yeah. it took a long time it took a lot for us to get ourselves in that space um but yeah yeah we are well, Caroline, thank you. You've shared so much really useful information for people. We'll put um, the social media links and contact details and stuff in the show notes if people want to find out more about what you're doing. But thank you so much. Thanks, Lisa. I appreciate it. And all the best to those property investors who want to get involved. And for those providers, keep going because we need more of you. Definitely. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.